So yeah, um, so I've been teaching a 850 person class uh, for the last few weeks and I'm fortunately off right now. I tag team it, teach it, big intro bio class and about a day before the class started, the people coordinating this series said, oh, and by the way, we changed the order of the classes that they take. So they're no longer taking introductory molecular biology, cell biology, biochemistry before your class. <laughs> so I had, to re I had to redo everything um, on the fly. And so I haven't slept in about a month. Um, <laughs> and so last night when I started thinking about this talk, I'm like, oh, I have a research talk I can give. And then I'm like, I should look at that talk I gave a few years ago to see how different it is from that talk. And I'm like, oh, um, it's, it's really not that different. So I stayed up until three redoing my talk. Um, bear with me if it's completely erratic and confusing. Uh, I hope it'll make some sense. Um, and I'm gonna, it's, it's heavy on concepts and ideas at the beginning. Please stop and we can talk about it. There's lots of data at the end, and if we don't get to the data, I don't care that much, um, but we'll, we'll see. Um, so, so I redid the title, make it simpler. Um, I want to talk about microbial phylogenomics and evolvability. And since I may not get to it at the end, um, there's lots of people involved in the stuff I'm going to tell you about, people in my lab, people who used to be in my lab, collaborators, um, and I should highlight these people as I, as I go through and talk about it. Um, so, what I spent a lot of time thinking about last night was, what the hell do I actually study? Um, and and the, the, reason, the reason that this is a big deal is um, we do, we, we're really broad in my lab, really, really broad. And there are sort of organizing themes to it, but it's still very, very broad. So I want to give you a little bit of perspective on what I think we work on, which is what I call phylogenomics and evolvability. Um, and I'll walk you through what I mean by this, but basically what we do related to this is we have model systems that we work on. We work on lots of different systems because I'm interested in the rules by which systems work rather than on a specific system. So we're interested in comparing different systems rather than working on one system. We develop methods and tools like analyzing data. Um, we develop re resources and reference data and those two are the things I talked about the last time and that I normally talk about a lot. And what I'm gonna focus on much more is the model systems rather than the methods and tools and reference data. We also do a lot of work which I'm not gonna talk extensively about on communication and participation in microbiology and in science. Um, and I'll mention this a little bit um, with citizen science. So what do I mean by um, phylogenomics and evolvability? I'm just gonna walk you through this. What I'm really interested in scientifically is the origin of new functions or the origin of novelty. And if you, you know, think about this in a really simplistic sense, I'm going to walk you through, you have a phylogenetic tree of three taxa. They have some trait in the past, the red feature, or whatever we want it to be. And some of the descendants from that common ancestor just stay the same. They inherit the ancestral trait. And you know, another node in the tree inherits the ancestral trait, not another one. But somewhere along the way, there's the invention of a new trait. And we you know, label this on the already forgotten where they, we label this, you know, a little tick mark, and here's this green function that evolved on this tree. And for many years, what I was interested in was what I would call intrinsic processes that would lead to the origin of these functions. That is, what happens within the genome of an organism that leads to the new function? So mutation, duplication, deletion, rearrangements, recombination. And I was interested in all the different mechanisms that would lead to this. And in particular, what I was interested in is what I call evolvability, which is not just how do these processes occur, but why do they differ between taxa? Why do some taxa have high mutation rates and others not have high mutation rates? Why do some taxa have no recombination and other taxa have high rates of recombination? How does this affect the probability that they're going to invent new functions? And so can we use information about this to actually make predictions about organisms and their future in response to selective pressures or in response to particular conditions? And I do this in the context of what I call phylogenomics, which is most of what I know about is analyzing sequence data. And so we use sequence data and phylogenetic analysis combined together to try and make sense out of these origin of new processes and novelty. And I'm just gonna walk you through a few examples of this um, that I've done in the past, just to give you an idea as to what I mean by sort of looking at these model systems and looking at evolvability. And this is focusing on this intrinsic novelty generation. So here's just a very simple example related to recombination. When I was in grad school, um, I got really interested in recombination processes. I worked in a lab that studied DNA repair, and 
Um, one of the things that we were interested in is the structure function relationships within the Rec A protein, which is involved in homologous recombination. And a postdoc had all this mutation data related to Rec A, and I'm not going to tell you all the details about it, but I got really interested in how to use comparative data from other taxa to make sense out of the data from E. coli and the crystal structure of E. coli and asked about whether or not the three-dimensional structure seemed to be conserved across different taxa, and I built phylogenetic trees of Rec A to try and place this in context with comparison to other organisms. And along the way, um, I developed tools and <coughs> methods that you could use to make sense out of this Rec A data. I designed PCR primers to amplify Rec A from different taxa to allow people to get more data I wanted. Um, so, so the structured analysis that I was doing was trying to look for compensatory substitutions over evolutionary time when you have an amino acid change at one point in the crystal structure, what amino acid change do you have at another point? This works really well for RNA structure when you have four possible nucleotides with 20 possible amino acids in protein structures. It's really hard, so we needed more data. So basically I said, okay, I'm gonna show people how to clone out Rec A from lots of different taxa and started doing this. And this you know, helped and um, one of the interesting things that came from this was Nancy Moran, who was working on endosymbionts, sent me an email saying, hey, can you send me your PCR primers? And I sent them to her, and she said, this is really weird. Bucnera, this endosymbiont of aphids, we can't get Rec A out of it. It had never been heard. All organisms were supposed to have Rec A. Later on, when people sequenced the genome, they showed that actually this organism is missing Rec A. And that's really important for the evolvability of these endosymbionts of these aphids. They don't have homologous recombination. They haven't invented another process to do it. They have completely lost homologous recombination. And that's very weird and very unusual and constrains their evolvability in all sorts of important ways. I also started generating like references and resources and trying to convince people um, to work on this. So I built websites about this and I got really involved in like the community of scientists for, you know, here's, a, this doesn't exist anymore, but I found it on the Wayback Machine, the Internet Archive, uh, my old Rec A website. Unfortunately, Stanford deleted it, but um, so, so I did things related to this and then kept trying to be involved in Rec A, although I've gotten interested in other things. So um, PCR turns out not to work that well for amplifying things that are protein coding genes because of the degeneracy of the code. So when metagenomics came along, we could then find hom homologs of all these other genes that we were not able to amplify with PCR and we showed that Rec A was a useful marker for phylogeny for organisms just like ribosomal RNA. There are a few other markers, and you can scan through metagenomic data sets and find all sorts of interesting things about Rec A. Not what I want to focus on, but that's sort of the general idea. And I then did the same thing with other mutation controlling processes, like mismatch repair. So mismatch repair is really interesting. Um, it's what many organisms use to limit the mutation rate when they make a replication error. Mismatch repair comes in and then corrects those replication errors. So. Um, uh, Tiger, I, I worked at Tiger for eight years, but this was before I worked at Tiger. They published the genome sequence of this organism, Helicobacter pylori, and they had this section of the paper that seemed really interesting to me, which said Helicobacter pylori has mutas, and therefore we think it has mismatch repair. And I was working on the evolution of mismatch repair at the time, and I said, well, that's weird. Every organism that has mismatch repair has mutas and mutal, not just mutas. And so, to make a long story short, I scanned through the genome for Helicobacter pylori. They have a mutas. But the MUNES that they have is weird. And when you build an evolutionary tree of the MUNES that they have, it doesn't group with the other, quote, normal MUNESes from bacteria. And I developed a method based upon this to predict functions of genes based on where they sit in a phylogenetic tree um, of, of other homologs of protein sequences. And I called this phylogenomics. That's when I got really interested in using genome data to study evolution. Turns out Helicobacter pylori has a very high mutation rate, so this is really important doesn't have a normal mutas and doesn't have mismatch repair. Um, just as an aside, that prediction of function based on where a gene sits in a phylogenetic tree is completely copied from what people did with ribosome RNA sequencing for many years, which was sequence a ribosome RNA gene of an organism and try and predict its biology based on where it sits relative to other taxa in the phylogenetic tree. This is what I worked on as an undergraduate on chemosynthetic symbionts. Um, so I had this background of predicting function by phylogenetic trees, and I just adapted it to working with protein sequences and protein function as opposed to organisms. Um, so we did lots of other things related to this. One thing called the X-Files, which related to genome rearrangements, another related to duplication processes, lots and lots of other model systems for working on intrinsic 
um, change and the variation between taxa in those processes and whether or not that led us to information about the biology of those organisms or their future responses to things like stresses and selection. However, um, I both got less interested in this, but I got more interested in something else, which uh, going back to my little model here for novelty origin, intrinsic processes are just one way that organisms get novelty. Another way is to steal novelty from other organisms. So for a while I got interested in lateral gene transfer and recombination between taxa because that allowed organisms to not have to invent the process themselves, but still acquire the novelty. And I spent a lot of time working on various aspects of recombination and lateral gene transfer. And the same type of thing, why did some organisms undergo a lot of lateral gene transfer and other organisms did not? What were the rules that told us which organisms were gonna have this and can that predict anything about their biology. And I'm not really gonna go into detail on this. We've worked on this with lots of different organisms. I'm just gonna say one example, this Wolbachia organism, which is a weird uh, group of organisms that are maternally transmitted in invertebrates. And because they're maternally transmitted, they've evolved all sorts of means to suppress the frequency or abundance of males in populations, <coughs> including killing males, making males sterile, <coughs> making males, um, and making females reproduce asexually, all sorts of interesting things. It's an intracellular bacterium transmitted only intracellularly, and many people prior to us sequencing this genome said all intracellular organisms shouldn't have any lateral gene transfer because they don't get exposed to lots of other DNA from the environment. And yet the Wolbachia gene was completely overrun by mobile elements, phage, and other lateral gene transfer sort of events. So again, why did Wolbachia have this but other intracellular symbionts and others not have it. And that is sort of a, the key question about the evolvability of different taxa. This opens up a whole window into Wolbachia biology by being able to suck up DNA from other organisms. Why doesn't Buchnera, for example, the endosymbionts of aphids do this? Um, okay, so again, got really interested in these extrinsic sources. And then I sort of remembered my past working um, that <coughs> phylogenetic tree that I showed you of ribosomal RNA taxa was on symbiotic bacteria that live inside marine invertebrates that couldn't be cultured that we needed to use ribosome RNA sequencing to figure out what they were. And I sort of rediscovered my interest in symbioses, in part in this context of novelty. So in addition to stealing genes, there's an even easier way to acquire novelty, which is just to work with another organism through some type of symbiosis, or work with multiple organisms through what you could call symbioses, or all the sort of hot rage right now is to work with thousands of taxa, that is the microbiomes or communities of organisms, and acquire functions that way. So most of what we've been doing in my lab for the last 15 years or so has been trying to figure out the rules by which a host in particular can interact with either single organisms or really thousands of organisms and acquire new functions. And can we figure out what those rules are? And in particular, can we manipulate that? in the long run. That is, if something goes wrong with the interaction between a host and a microbiome in some way, can we use our understanding of how those systems work in order to make predictions about the future of these organisms? So what I'm going to walk you through is some examples of where we've done this in the context of studying evolvability and symbiosis. Does that make sense here? So. Um, and in addition, it's not that I'm sort of completely ignoring the intrinsic forms of evolvability. We still do a little bit of work on that, but we're much more focused on how organisms acquire novelty by interactions or symbiosis. So what I'm going to focus on is one subcategory that represents most of what we work on in my lab, which is this issue, this triangle that some people have described in the past, which is the interaction between a host a multicellular organism of some kind, basically, a microbiome that is a community of microbes, and a stress, some type of stress that that host microbiome system is placed under. And what can we learn about either the host response to this stress in the context of the microbiome, or if you remove the microbiome, what happens? What can we learn about the microbiome response to the stress? And what can we learn about the two together? And in particular, what I'm really interested in is when you put this system under stress, are Historically, it seems like um, multicellular eukaryotes are relatively incompetent at inventing new processes themselves, or in fact, they may not be incompetent, they're just more likely to acquire new processes by interactions with other organisms. 
And so it seems like, and this is why people are really into like the human microbiome, it seems like we should be able to manipulate that situation so that we can introduce new microbes and have them show up in a system and maybe restore functions that were lost or introduce new functions into systems. So I'm going to focus on this triangle for the rest of the talk. This, that's our model system now, the host microbiome stress triangle. So I'm going to give a couple of examples of this. Um, a couple of categories of this with a few examples in some of the categories and one example in the other category. So one area that is of great interest is this triangle again in relation to nutrient acquisition. That is many hosts in particular and also the microbiome, it's the, it's not, they can't do certain things on their own. It's only through the interaction between the host and microbiome that they're able to acquire all the nutrients they need for certain um, conditions. And uh, one sort of weird, interesting, simple example that I'm going to tell you about relates back to that, my first work on symbioses with this ribosome RNA sequencing, which relates to carbon acquisition. So when I was an undergraduate, I got into this lab of this professor, Colleen Cavanaugh, who had discovered this bizarre symbiosis between giant tube worms in the bottom of the ocean and chemosynthetic bacteria that live inside these tube worms. And basically, when people went down to the bottom of the ocean with the Alvin submarine in 1977, to study geology, they were looking for evidence for seafloor spreading, they found the second highest density of biomass next to tropical rainforests. And the communities that they first found were dominated by these giant tube worms, six feet tall, long, weird worms that have no mouth, no digestive system, no ability, as far as people could tell, to ingest any particles of food. And what she eventually showed was that they basically function a lot like plants. They have bacteria that live inside of them intracellularly inside a special organ in, that the worms feed those bacteria hydrogen sulfide, which is their source of energy, carbon dioxide, which is their source of carbon, and also bring in oxygen for the worm itself. And the bacteria make everything that the worm needs, just like chloroplasts do for plants. And it's a chemosynthetic symbiosis with these animals, and the animals are really, really weird now because of this symbiosis. And that's what I, I worked on a system of this so you don't find it just in the bottom of the ocean. Anywhere where hydrogen sulfide is really abundant or other highly reduced compounds are really abundant, there's some animal that has taken advantage of this to have chemosynthetic symbionts that make all of its food for them. And so I worked on this as an undergraduate, then forgot about it for a while, and then I went to Tiger, and I emailed Colleen one day. She was still working on this, and I said, hey, we should put in a proposal to sequence the genomes of some of these symbionts, and we got funding to do this. Um, and we sequenced the genomes of a few of them. Um, and just, you know, to make a long story short, what the genomes show is they're not just, you know, fixing carbon, right? They're not just making sugars. They have to make everything. So they have to make all the amino acids that the host is not getting from its diet. They have to make all the vitamins and cofactors that the host needs. They have to synthesize all the nutrients for these um, worms. And it makes complete sense when you think about it in retrospect that they're really not bringing in anything other than, you know, simple chemicals to feed to the bacteria. And again, this is really important for understanding the dynamic of these organisms in part because what I didn't tell you is some of them have something even weirder, which is when they're larvae, these tube worms, they eat. <laughs> so they don't have the symbionts when they're larvae. They acquire the symbionts and then become sessile and attach and grow into these giant worms. And so they have this weird transition between normal animal heterotrophy, and then this bizarre chemoautotrophy and symbiosis when they're adults. And so having an understanding of that interaction is really important for understanding the biology of a lot of these organisms. So another, there, there are thousands of these examples of nutrient acquisition through symbioses, and I'm sure you're familiar with many of them, ruminants and other things. I'm just going to give you one other uh, example related to um, this type of sort of nutrient interaction. It relates to the glassy wing sharpshooter, which if you're in the wine industry is a freaky thing to see. It's the, one of the vectors for Pierce's disease in grapes as well as in other organisms. Um, and to make a long story short, many people have been working on organisms like the sharpshooter because they have a really weird mode of feeding. They live on xylem sap. They live on basically mineral water. Um, and how on earth can an organism survive off of xylem, especially in the face of the plant response to organisms feeding off xylem, which is to suck out all the nutrients that animals would basically need to survive from their xylem to prevent animals from feeding on their xylem. 
What do sharpshooters do? They do something similar to what aphids do. So aphids have a similar thing, but they feed on phloem, which is a little more nutrient rich. Sharpshooters have bacterial symbionts that make everything that they need. So we did work on this with Nancy Moran um, when I was a tiger. And basically, long story short, there are two symbionts that live inside these specialized tissues in the sharpshooter, um, one called Solcia, one called Baumania. And after a lot of work, we basically showed um, that Solcia is making the amino acids for the host, all the essential amino acids that it can't get from any other means. And Baumania is making the vitamins and cofactors. And together, they make everything needed by the host to supplement its diet. And it's just incredibly, again, incredibly weird, but in retrospect, it makes sense. And since we did this work, lots of other people, Nancy Moran, John McCutcheon, and others have shown an incredible diversity within the xylem feeding organisms <coughs> as to what interaction they have with symbionts, how many symbionts they have, and what the symbionts are doing to provide the nutrients for that system. And just going back to this intrinsic evolvability issue, um, so it turns out that there's lots of um, variation among endosymbionts in their evolutionary rates. The ones that have the highest evolutionary rates, you can see by the long branches on these evolutionary trees, those are the ones that are missing the DNA mismatch repair. So there are many endosymbionts that have lost all sorts of processes, including DNA mismatch repair. Once you lose DNA mismatch repair, your mutation rate goes up very high. And what are, are they doing anything to compensate for this? Does this affect what those endosymbionts are doing versus what other endosymbionts are doing? Oh, and I have some key lessons on here, but I may skip over them in the interest of time. But you know, uh, sometimes more than one symbiont is interesting and important. So another um, you know, type of nutrient stress that organisms experience is low nitrogen levels. There's lots of examples of this where symbionts are making, are fixing nitrogen for some host in some system. There's lots of examples of this throughout uh, the plant and animal tree of life. I'm just going to quickly tell you one other example. So um, we spent a few years working on this weird giant corn that grows in the mountains of Mexico that Howard Shapiro, who is the head of plant sciences at Mars, had been obsessed with for about 30 years since going to Mexico and seeing this. So there's this giant variety of corn that the Farmers claimed that they were not feeding supplemental nitrogen into the systems, and yet it's growing incredibly well. To make a very long story short, it has this mucilage that it secretes from these aerial roots. The mucilage it seems to be a good home for nitrogen fixation. It's basically very low in nitrogen levels, high in energy. It's basically the same thing that we do in the lab to culture nitrogen fixers, is you suck out all the available nitrogen. The only things that can grow there are things that fix nitrogen. And now things grow there. And then somehow, in a way that we don't understand right now, the plant is able to acquire some of that nitrogen. Either the cells are actually exporting it, or they die, or in some way. So there's these varieties of corn that at least can somewhat acquire some nitrogen via fixation rather than um, supplementing it into, you know, by fertilizer. And again, we don't know exactly how this works, but having information about this interaction is really important for understanding these you know, other varieties of corn, these land races, as well as, of course, the hope is that you could transfer something about this into um, production corn. That seems probably really complicated, because you would have to make production corn, make aerial roots, and secrete you know, gobs of mucilage from the aerial roots, and have the right interaction with the microbiome. But anyway, it's, some, it's an interesting story about nitrogen fixation and symbionts. Um, and uh, oh, just one other thing we're working on, I, I call this a nutrient category because we're trying to figure out how um, animals do make, become, do scent marking. And so in cats, we've been basically copying work that's been done in hyenas and other organisms, where in hyenas they've shown that the hyenas secrete food for microbes. Those microbes live off of the food and then produce volatile compounds. And individual hyenas have different microbes that live off of that food and therefore produce different scents. And you can have an individual scent marking that's based upon everybody making the same food, but having different microbes that are feeding off those food and producing volatile compounds. And we think the same thing is going on in domestic cats as well as in wild cats. Um, just, uh, I'm just going to go back to this for a second. So basically what we did was um, Holly Gans, who was in my lab, took swabs from one, it's one single cat at this point. Single cat, we cultured microbes from the anal gland of this single cat. 
We, with Christina Davis at UC Davis, we did volatile compounds from those samples. And then in the cultures, we also did volatile compounds from the cultures. And we showed that the microbes that are in culture are producing similar volatiles to what are found in the direct samples from the anal gland. And the microbes that we have in culture, at least some of them, are in relatively high abundance in the anal gland samples. We don't know exactly what's going on yet, but we have some suggestive evidence that microbes in the system are able to produce the volatile compounds that are coming out of these anal secretion anal glands. Um, okay, so the, 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 one of the two sort of big things that we work on is where the stress is a pathogen. So this is a lot of people work on this type of sort of microbiome stress host interaction where um, there are two questions that a lot of people ask about this and we sort of have worked on both. One is, is the microbiome pattern that an individual has related to what the susceptibility to a particular pathogen? And that is, so people have done lots of work in mouse, for example, where they've shown that the gut microbiome that you have influences the probability of salmonella infection, for example. And the hope is then that you could manipulate that in some way so that you could make people less susceptible to that infection. And that's what some probiotics, you know, are supposed to do and what some other, you know, prebiotics and other types of manipulations are supposed to do in various systems. And we work on this in a variety of systems. What we're um, also interested in is are there any microbes from those particular samples that appear to directly suppress the pathogen in some way that could be used as a targeted probiotic into, into a particular system. So we've done a, a few different projects in this area. One is with Walter Boyce um, at UC Davis where he had a lot of samples where they were focused on flu infection. They did genomics of the flu and a lot of other things about the flu and at the same time had information about different species and the variety of different flu strains that were in these different species. And what we basically helped them do was characterize the gut microbiome from these same samples. And then um, Holly Gann, Sarah Hurd, LaDonne DeRude, Alana Furl, and other people in my lab analyzed this data and basically came up with a model based upon this data that said there do appear to be certain types of microbiome patterns in the individuals that did not have flu versus the individuals that did have flu. And there also were differences between individual, um, individuals that had different strains of flu. Um, so we basically identified you know, what are called OTUs, that's a, sort of the moral equivalent of species, although it's not quite operational taxonomic units from sequence data, um, that um, appeared to contribute to the probability that an individual would have flu or not have flu. And this has been seen in lots of other systems with flu infection. This is one of the first examples of seeing it with birds. This doesn't mean that they're protecting those individuals from flu. It could mean that individuals of flu have a different diet because they're sick and then their microbiome is different. It could mean that individuals of flu have different interactions with other organisms and get a different microbiome. So no one's done the experiment to actually test whether or not this is a protective, but this is the first step in sort of hypothesis generating to then go in and say, maybe there are some taxa that are seen in overabundance in the individuals that don't have flu that could be used as in some type of protective way. Um, this is a related story, although it's not really about the pathogen. So I have a graduate student, Katie Dalhausen, who went to Australia on a trip, basically, and completely fell in love with the, the microbiome story associated with koalas and chlamydia infections, and it ended up becoming her thesis project. I know, it's really bizarre. This got, John Oliver picked this up when we had a paper about this, and there was a big debate about koalas and chlamydia um, in the New York Times and other places. So, so here's the story. Um, koalas live off of eucalyptus, most of them, I think all of them. Eucalyptus has a lot of toxins in it. The model is that the gut microbiome in the koalas helps them detoxify some of those toxins. It hasn't been actually really proven, but that's basically the model. There's a chlamydia epidemic going throughout koala populations. It causes blindness, so it's like the trachoma equivalent, but it also is a sexually transmitted disease, and it's decimating um, koala populations. And many koalas, when they're either really sick or they get hit by a car or something else, they get brought into a veterinary hospital, and they all have chlamydia and they get treated with antibiotics. And if you treat them with normal doses of antibiotics that you would use for some equivalent organism, they die. And the thought is that they're dying because now they can't detoxify the eucalyptus 
and they're getting sick, so they, the antibiotics are curing the chlamydia and now making them have trouble with digestion. And so what she got interested in is trying to tease this apart. And she worked with some people at a wildlife hospital there to collect samples from like 16 to 17 koalas, some of which had chlamydia, some of which did not, some of which were treated with antibiotics, some of which did not. And she analyzed data in a similar way to the flu story and asked, are there any taxa that appear to show up in either the ones that survived antibiotic treatment or the ones that died after antibiotic treatment or ones that were never treated in some way? So basically, this is the model. They're sick. They get antibiotics. They get even sicker. Um, and so does it, how does that relate to this um, eating the eucalyptus? And so basically, we did sort of network analysis of the microbiome in all of these different koalas, you know, very small sample size, but still teased it apart and found a couple of taxa that appeared to be overabundant in the individuals that survived the antibiotic treatment or, you know, were, were healthy. Um, and interestingly, um, a, if you do a big heat map analysis and a statistical analysis, the taxa that came out as among the most predictive or most correlated to health status included this organism, Lone Pinella koalarum, or close relatives of that. This is the one organism that has been cultured from koala guts that degrades some of the compounds that are found in eucalyptus that people have proposed might be involved in actually protecting koalas from the toxins in eucalyptus. So again, we don't have proof that this is what's going on here, but the fact that this sort of statistical analysis, the first, the top hit that we came out of this with was with an organism that at least a relative of it in the lab is able to degrade the toxins is pretty suggestive of something interesting going on in the koala system. Yeah. Uh, so, so the veterinarians um, have developed over many years uh, massively low dose antibiotic treatments, basically for koalas, because they find that when they give them high doses, they they all get sick and die. And when you give them lower doses, it's sort of borderline. But they haven't really proven um, exactly what's going on in this system, but. The number one phenotype that they report is GI issues after the antibiotic treatment. So they get really constipated and they get you know, bloating and they you know, seem to be starving in some way. And so that's the number one symptom. But again, it hasn't been proven. Yeah, if you test the diet, you can show that if it's an antibiotic cognitive Yeah, I don't know if they've done that or not. Um, I don't think they have. I think they basically only eat eucalyptus. And I think it's specific for particular types of eucalyptus, but I don't, I don't know a lot of the details on that. Um, so we've now sequenced the genome of this, and we've also done metagenomics, and we're trying to scan through the data to find candidate genes that might be involved in degrading some of the different compounds in uh, eucalyptus. Another um, area that is under work in my lab by two students also kind of in a way relates to a personal obsession of theirs. Um, so I have two students, Sonia Ghosh and Marina DeLon, who both have become uh, passionate and fascinated, passionate about and fascinated by this story of the amphibian decimation that's occurring across the globe by these chytrid fungal infections. And so in particular, there's one species of chytrid that is spread throughout the globe that infects all sorts of amphibian populations and is thought to be responsible for hundreds of species extinctions and thousands of you know, listing of organisms as endangered. And basically, chytrids are kind of nasty because of the fungi. They're one of the few lineages that's able to swim, modile in the marine environment. And so this is thought to be partly responsible for why they're affecting amphibian populations much more than other populations. So what they're interested in is this triangle, again, frogs and their skin microbiome and the chytrid. And there's prior work that has suggested that there is some type of interaction there. There's even a probiotic therapy that there's one paper about relating to one organism that people have introduced back into some <coughs> populations that appears to protect them from the chytrid. So basically what they're doing is similar to the stories that I just told you about, which is going to frog populations, surveying them, collecting samples, looking at the abundance of the chytrid, looking at the microbiome, and looking for whether or not there are any individual taxa that appear to be predictive of not being infected by the chytrid, and then culturing organisms from these systems and trying to show in the lab either that those organisms suppress the chytrid in some way, or that we can um, introduce them back into systems that might protect the animals in some way. 
Um, this one, many of the taxa that you grow from the frog skin are purple and they produce this um, violacin pigment that has been shown, at least in some cases, to be antifungal. And the organism that has been used as a probiotic or proposed as a probiotic for chytrid infections is an organism that produces this violation compound. Um, so that's what Sonia is focused on, is sort of isolating these other violation producing organisms, trying to see if in the lab they suppress the growth of the chytrid in some way. Um, and I won't go through all the data that she has that led her to which taxa to look at. They're close relatives, basically, of the Janthinobacterium that are in her system that appear to be overabundant in the ones that have low chytrid levels. Some of them she has cultures of, and we're now doing genomics and experiments on them. What I want to mention is that my other student, Marina de Leon, doesn't, doesn't believe a lot of this, in a way. Um, she thinks that violation is, you know, um, not particularly good, you know, um, in some cases as an antifungal, and what she wants to test is whether or not it's the organism, that Janthinobacterium, that is doing something as opposed to the violation that's it's producing. And one of the ways she's testing this is by transforming other bacteria with a plasmid that makes violacine to see if those organisms now are able to suppress chytrid growth. Um, and, and so I, as I haven't mentioned this in most of the other cases, as part of most of the work that we're doing on all these pathogen systems, we want to have culture collections of organisms, both for getting genome data to interpret the environmental data, to do experiments on whether or not they produce some compound that might suppress the pathogen and eventually use them as tests for some type of probiotic therapy for these ecosystems. And we have basically armies of undergraduates in my lab, as I will know, um, who basically we bring in and then they spend a bunch of time just culturing organisms from particular ecosystems, identifying them with ribosomal RNA sequencing, maybe eventually sequencing the genomes and also now doing experiments to look at whether or not in the lab they at least suppress the pathogen in some way. And so this is just an example. One of the students that's working with Sonia has been um, culturing. We have you know, two or three hundred cultures of organisms from these frogs, and they're now basically doing a medium throughput, not high throughput, uh, suppressing screen to grow the chytrid and look at whether or not these individual microbes are somehow suppressing the chytrid growth in some way. All right. Um, a somewhat related category that we're also interested in is I'm just broadly calling human impacts on systems. So you, again, you have a host microbiome and there's some type of human-induced impact to that system. And you know, the antibiotic story with chlamydia is clearly a human impact, so I could have listed this in the, that category. And many pathogen introductions probably have a big human impact um, component, but I'm just sort of listing this as a different area. One of them that I've been really interested in and I'm not going to talk a lot about is just domestication. So the corn story is interesting because it's thought by a lot of people that the domestication of corn um, led to, you know, really easy use of corn, growth of corn, good genetics and other things, but the associations with some beneficial microbes may have been lost during that domestication or the exact details of that association may have been changed in some way. And so many people throughout all sorts of different agricultural organisms are going back to the land races or going back to the wild relatives and saying, are there any things in the microbiome there that are not present in the domesticated version? And can we see if any of them might be reintroduced in some way um, to benefit that individual? So we've done a lot of work in this area. In particular, we did a lot of work on rice. And now we're doing this work, been doing this work on corn. And I want to talk about a lot of the details. But the basic idea is that if we understand the host microbiome interaction in the domesticated versions, we can then go to the wild relatives, the land races, and others and ask what is different there. And then you know, the hope is that uh, you could just introduce a new microbe into the domesticated version. The reality is that the actual host side of the interaction is also frequently changed. You can't just introduce a lost microbe into the system and get it to work. So you need to tease apart the actual interactions in order to understand whether or not it would be possible to introduce this, you know, wild relatives microbiome into the domestic version. Or, you know, so I'm on the scientific advisory board of Indigo Agriculture, or you just do a massively high throughput screen that many places are doing and you have hundreds of thousands of strains that you work with and 
doesn't matter if you understand the mechanisms completely, you can potentially get some that work in that sense. So lots of people are doing that type of thing with uh, plant agriculture. Many are doing it with animals. There's lots of interest in this in humans. So there are people screening um, the indigenous populations of humans as well as chimpanzees and other great apes to try and find microbes that might be, in theory, useful to reintroduce into humans. So temperature, changing temperature is a big area of interest at UC Davis and other areas. What are its effects on communities uh, or individual organisms? Most of the work in host systems has focused on the host response to temperature stress. But there's clearly a component where the microbiome is involved in some of the responses to that stress. And in theory, potentially might be useful as something to modify in order to protect individuals from the temperature stress. So um, we've been collaborating with Jay Stakowitz's lab at uh, UC Davis on doing experiments in, um, in seagrass. Uh, so um, Alana Furl, who was in my lab, was coordinating this project with a lot of people at Bodega Bay Marine <coughs> Lab and also in Jay Stakowitz's lab. The basic idea is to rear seagrass in these controlled environments, expose them to temperature changes, monitor the changes that are going on in those individuals, and look at what they were focusing on was the host side, and they added basically a mic what we call a microbiome layer to these experiments where you also look at the microbiome response. And so the microbiome definitely has differential responses to the temperature treatment, and those responses are correlated to the genotype of the individual plant. So individual plants, microbiomes respond differently depending on the genotype of that plant to temperature. Again, we don't know if there's any mechanistic involvement of the microbiome in this case. Um, we just know that it responds differentially to temperature depending on the genotype or the source pool of that particular plant. And one of the challenges with this was, as I'll come back to in a few minutes, was we had no context in doing this. So we you know, looked at the microbiome and we didn't know a lot when we originally worked on this about the microbiome of seagrass and how it interacted with the host. So interpreting this experiment was really challenging because there was just most of the taxa that showed up here didn't have close relatives that we had any data for. There are very few cultures that have been coming from seagrass. There's very little information to provide context. So some people here have heard about this from Raquel Pixoto. <coughs> I'm just going to quickly go through it. She's been doing sabbatical in my lab for the last uh, year and a half or so and um, from Brazil. And she basically is interested in this triangle related to pollution and other environmental threats like temperature and climate change. And so she's done this really interesting work on mangroves, for example, where she takes it to the next level compared to what we've been doing mostly in my lab, which is um, they're characterizing the microbiome and looking at the interaction of the microbiome and various stresses, but they just jump right ahead and are introducing um, what they call potentially beneficial microbes into the system. So they cult build a culture collection from mangroves, or as I'll tell you in a minute, from coral. They characterize what taxa those are from, and then they basically say, well, this group of organisms is frequently known to be associated with nitrogen fixation, or frequently known to be associated with some other protection of other organisms, or in fact, this organism. Let's make a cocktail of those. It's like a fecal transplant, basically, for mangroves. And when they did this in mangroves, um, in this polluted environment in Brazil, they basically found out only if you add these um, potentially beneficial microbes to the system and plant the mangroves after you've introduced them, do the mangroves survive in this polluted, oil-rich environment. When you plant the mangroves without that beneficial consortium or that putative beneficial consortium, they don't uh, grow as well in this environment. So they don't know the mechanism that's going on here. They don't know, you know exactly what's going on, but they have sort of leapfrogged over characterizing the entire ecosystem and just saying, let's just do experiments with cultured organisms and see if they can provide some sort of benefit and then work backwards from there to figure out what is going on to try and guide it in some other way. And what I'm most interested in is the work that she's doing in coral, which she's also been now doing uh, in my lab for a while. A lot of this is based on work that she did previously, previously becoming the Davis where basically they're interested in the temperature stress in coral and pathogen stress, and they're doing the same thing that I mentioned in mangroves. Oh, I just wanted to show this. I have an undergraduate in my lab who's been doing coral culturing who just like spontaneously one day posted this um, artistic rendition of coral bleaching, um, and it got all sorts of good press. There were stories written about it around here. Um, she's one of the undergraduates that's basically just working with Raquel to do culturing from the system. 
So basically the idea is what I was outlining before. You take coral, you culture organisms from that system, you identify them, and then you basically come up with hypotheses for things that might provide beneficial effects against temperature, against pathogens. You mix those with other coral, and you introduce them into a system and then test whether or not those mixes provide temperature resistance or pathogen resistance. And again, it's sort of the equivalent to fecal transplants, except they're, they're not doing single organisms. That's why it's sort of, I think it's like fecal transplants, but they're doing defined organisms. So they've cultured them and then make these mixes. And again, you don't know if something works. You don't know if it's an individual organism in that mix or some interaction of the organisms in the mix or the entire collection of things in the mix. But they've basically found through a series of experiments that they can get increased resistance to pathogens and increased resistance to temperature by these introductions. And now they're basically moving to the next level in some places by introducing these back into wild ecosystems. So most of this was done in the lab. And it's really, really remarkable um, findings. And uh, I think it's, we're shifting a lot of the work that we're thinking of doing in the lab from, you know, I'm a basic scientist, so this meticulous characterizing everything before doing an actual practical experiment to trying to jump over that in some cases and do more experimental tests of the potential benefits of organisms rather than just predicting them over and over <laughs> before doing those tests. So the latest is that their culture, their culturing um, has not produced a massively diverse collection of microbes from coral. And they, everybody in the coral community, there are lots of other people doing similar things to Raquel. Um, there's actually a network that she's now created called the BMMO network, the Beneficial Marine Microbe, I don't know what the O is, organism, I think, um, network. And, um, but many of the people say, we just don't have a diverse collection of organisms. So one of the things we've been trying to do is increase the types of conditions that we use to culture organisms from the coral system. And that's what a lot of the undergraduates in my laboratory have been doing. They basically blend up coral. And one of the new things is to um, uh, add back in like physical bits of the coral structure into the culturing condition. And this seems to really help certain organisms grow in the system. And that's what a lot of people have been doing. And that's what they've been uh, doing in my lab. And so then, the last thing I want to talk about um, is uh, a very similar type of thing, but focusing on the environment changing rather than some you know, specific stress or specific stressor. And so when a host microbiome system is in a particular place and it either moves to a new environment or the environment changes in some way, it changes the, you know, the host is going to respond to that, the microbiome is going to respond to that, and the interaction is going to change. And the one I want to tell you about just at the end here is work that we've been doing in seagrass. Um, and so I got really interested in seagrass when I was actually teaching this intro bio class many, many years ago. And I was co-teaching it with a plant paleontologist. And he showed this um, really interesting figure, which is basically similar to this figure here, which he basically said, yeah, seagrass are really weird. They actually are three separate lineages of plants within this one order, the Elismatales. And they appear to have separately three separate times gone from freshwater into saltwater, and then converged upon the seagrass phenotype from after that you know, invasion of the marine environment. They converged on morphology, reproductive strategies, physiology, all sorts of other properties. So <coughs> we got a grant from the War Foundation to basically start to look at the seagrass microbiome interaction and ask the question, OK, this is a you know, sort of a normal uh, flowering plant, but living submerged in seawater. What have they done with their interaction with the microbiome? How did they adapt to the seawater? Did they bring their, their aquatic or terrestrial microbes with them? And then those microbes adapted to the saltwater environment? Or did they recruit new microbes from the saltwater environment that would allow them to live in the saltwater environment and do different things? And so that's basically what we've been looking at for the last four or five years, um, doing sort of general biogeography of the plants, surveying them, looking at where the different microbes are, predicting their functions based upon originally ribosome RNA sequencing and then um, genomics. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do this without participation from a network called the Zen Network, the Zoster Experimental Network, which is a collaboration across like 40 or 50 research labs that all try and coordinate studies of seagrass, mostly in their summer seasons. Um, and we got help with them by uh, sending out kits to them that they collected samples for us, and then we brought them back to the lab for microbiome characterization. 
that's the, the gifts that we basically made. Um, Laura has helped make many of those. Um, and uh, I don't want to tell you all the details about this, but basically, just like you see with any other ecosystem in any other plant, there's lots of variation within individuals and different parts of the plant and the particular microbiome that you see. The patterns that we see sort of make functional sense that is associated with the roots. So there, most of the species of seagrass have roots, not all of them do, and they're in anoxic sediments, usually loaded with hydrogen sulfide. We see lots of sulfate reducers and um, other sulfur metabolizing organisms or predicted to be associated with the roots. Um, you know, lots of interesting things. We've tried to culture a lot of them, although have not been completely successful. We see biogeography across the landscape so that there are, you know, local microbiomes in the East Coast versus the West Coast versus other parts of the planet. Um, we see more of this in certain parts of the plant than in others. We're just sort of starting to build basically the equivalent of, you know, what we know about lots of other organisms and their microbiome. This is just sort of the natural history of the microbiome in seagrass. Um, and again, this is now helping place those experiments on the temperature adaptations in context because we don't just list taxa now, we can make better predictions about the functions of those taxa and then come up with sort of organisms to test or hypotheses to test about them. Um, uh, we've, we've collaborated with people doing specific other similar experiments to temperature. So what happens during ammonification? Cassie Ettinger in my lab with Jessica Abbott and Susan Williams who were, was at Bodega Marine Lab were basically doing a succession study associated with ammonification experiments. Um, Cassie has also been looking at whether or not plants in the center of a habitat are different in their microbiome than plants on the edge, which is known as the edge effect, um, and they are. Um, most, almost everything I've sort of hinted at, although I haven't shown you a ton of data, um, is about bacterial associations. We're really interested in the fungal associations, in particular seagrass. So terrestrial plants, most of them have mutualistic associations with various fungi, in particular the mycorrhizae that help them bring in nutrients and water um, to their roots. If you live in water, um, that type of association isn't thought to be quite as essential. And when you look at seagrass, they don't, nobody has ever found anything that appears to be the normal mycorrhizae associated with seagrass. But they're covered in fungi. So what are those fungi doing? Are they doing some new function? Are they parasites? Are they, what is going on with the fungal associations with seagrass? And that's Cassie's thesis, basically, and what she's interested in. Um, and so we've done, originally, Amplicon sequencing to characterize the fungi that are there. She now has a culture library of the fungi. We're trying to do metagenomics of some of the fungi to better understand what are the fungal associations with these plants. And then um, we also got funding from the Joint Genome Institute to bring back in the host into these studies. So we there basically they did um, host sequencing, SNP discovery for 250 or so individual seagrass plants collected from around the globe with kits made by Laura. Um, and um, we also have ribosomal RNA PCR data and ITS PCR data and 18S PCR data from each of those individual plants that we have the host genotype for. And we're, once we get around to it, gonna try to do basically a GWAS study of the microbiome, where we treat the microbiome as the trait uh, compared to the genome-wide association that you can do with all the SNP data for the host. Um, and all of this, in the end, all of this is now coming, the, the point that we're going for is microbiome manipulation in seagrass. And we want to do this both to understand the microbiome interactions in the lab, but also because, like we see with coral, seagrass are under massive threat across the globe. They're incredibly important in ecosystems for the habitats for marine invertebrates, for primary production, for coastal stability, for all sorts of other um, important functions. And yet they are also being decimated by pollution, by climate threats, by pathogen increases and other things. And we would like to be able to do something similar to what Raquel is doing with coral with seagrass because people are trying to transplant seagrass into particular places. They frequently don't take hold and die really quickly is there a microbiome component that can help with those seagrass restorations? So we have what we call massively parallel undergraduates um, <laughs> doing culturing um, in the lab. We're trying to build up a library of cultures from seagrass to do this. We have lots of different students um, that are working on this, both with bacteria and also with fungi. We're sequencing the genomes of these. And then 
Um, I'll just end with this last tiny little story, which is I have, um, I didn't plan on this, but I've rediscovered my roots in a way, looking at the roots of seagrass, which is that with Laura, we took some of these samples that we were doing biogeography of the seagrass and took those same exact DNA samples and did metagenomic sequencing. And we scanned through the data and we found a really interesting thing. If you classify the reeds that come out with this kaiju method and you zoom in on some of them, it turns out on the roots of seagrass, there are lots of sequences that phylogenetically appear to be closely related to the sulfur oxidizing chemosymbionts of marine invertebrates. This is of great interest because as I mentioned before, um, the larvae of some of these marine invertebrates don't have the symbionts in them and they're thought to get colonized from environmental samples, sort of like the squid vibrio interaction and many other rhizobia legume interaction. Nobody has known where those symbionts live when they're in their free living phase. No one has ever found them previously. Um, this was the fur arc, well, we got scooped by another paper that found a very similar thing, but basically we think that now many of these sulfur oxidizing chemosymbionts may be hanging out around and in seagrass roots. And that is a really convenient way for the larvae of these invertebrates to find them. They just have to find seagrass, and then they can get colonized by these symbionts. So this is back, um, the thing I worked on in Colleen Cavanaugh's lab was a clam called Solomyovelum that is found in seagrass beds, the same seagrass that we have been doing the seagrass microbiome interaction. I used to go out as an undergraduate and dig up clams and throw away the seagrass that was in the way. Um, but now I'm interested in this potential interaction with the clams, seagrass, microbiome, symbionts. And I will uh, leave it there. I won't tell you about our other environmental change, which is what happens when you split an environment in two by the rise of the Panamanian Isthmus. It's really cool, but I won't tell you about that. And then I'll just leave, leave you there. Thanks.